Welcome to the Filmmakers 412 podcast. I'm your host, Michael Ray. Today's guest is Alex Kasson. Alex is a writer, director, filmmaker, and the owner of Indie Ground Films. In today's interview, we talk about his career path and his love for scriptless filmmaking. Here's the interview with Alex Kasson. Alex, thank you very much for stopping by. I've been glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great. I've heard a lot about you from a lot of different people, so it's really nice to meet you. And our little chat beforehand was even interesting, so I think this is going to be a good one. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so give us a brief history of um, how you got into this. Um, how I got into this, I grew up on a little in a little town in Utah and always knew I wanted to get into filmmaking. I always knew I wanted to be a, a director and make movies. I went to school for a while in southern Utah, but they didn't really have a filmmaking course, so I took a couple like acting classes to meet directors and things like that. I have no interest in acting, but I was told... If you want to be a director, you should know how to work with actors. Did some journalism courses for a year, and then my friend from college for, was from California, and we both got fed up with Utah, so we just packed up and went to L.A., as you do. Kind of just bummed around Southern California for a while, and then eventually I got hired to work on some reality TV shows and got in the art department. When you were first hired, what were you hired as? Well, a friend of mine was running a dance studio in Palm Springs, and she knew some people that were filming a reality TV show called Average Joe that was just about to start down there. And I was hired technically as a production assistant, and I had no previous on-set experience. And that day, they asked me if I wanted to be the DP's camera assistant, and I had no idea what that meant, but I said, sure. It was a little pay bump, just a tiny pay bump. And so they threw me into, I, I would start my day as a PA, end my day as a PA, and in the middle I would do like 12 hours of camera assistant work. And it was horrible. I hated it. I, I'm not a camera guy. I'm not a tech guy. Really? What don't you like? Most people that over are Over-under into... cables. I can't over-under cables at all. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's weird how some people are really like just so fanatical about that. It's great. And, I, you know, like if it was something that I was able to kind of like zero in and focus on details and remember them and, and whatnot, then that's fine. That's not the way my brain always works. So. Wait, wait, wait. You are you like to produce, right? Isn't that like one of your favorite Different kind things? of details, I think. That's, yeah. that's like the same side of the brain, though, isn't it? Um, sort of. Sometimes. Huh. Producing's I think, a lot broader. And what you bring to the table as a producer is... But, you know, everybody's a bit different. Okay, sorry to bother. I mean, I... Oh, no, that's great. But, yeah, so I did... Um, the same company didn't hate me, and they hired me back to work in art department on the next project called Cowboy U, and I ended up just loving art department and did that kind of jump between reality TV show, did some post-production work, and worked as a logger transcriber uh, or art department or camera assistant, whatever they would find me for or find room for me. And then I would also be working as a production designer on like little low budget, like $200,000, like sci-fi or horror films or whatever. Anyway, uh, eventually got tired of LA. I made my way up to Portland. And every, every time I kind of packed up and moved, um, I would start as a PA again. I, I, and so I'm kind of a terrible PA because I was never really a PA in LA. So I moved up to Portland, tried to be a PA, ended up getting married to a Brit and she dragged me over to Scotland. So I had to start again you know, getting whatever jobs I could find, moved to LA or moved to London after that and kind of got out of the business for a while, moved back to LA, moved back to Pittsburgh. So it was just kind of like jumping all over the place. And in Pittsburgh, I just kind of bowed out of the film industry for a while. I had my own feature film that I had to try to finish. I wanted to, I'm not a big freelance guy, so I'd prefer having a nine to five if I can do it. If I can't be in charge of my own productions, I would rather just like have a steady gig if that makes sense. And then, yeah, I worked in property management for a while while I got my film done. And as soon as it was ready to kind of put out into the world, I quit my job and then luckily got hired doing commercial work. So I've been, 2019 was a really busy year for me. Probably my busiest year since like first year in LA maybe. So it was a good year in Pittsburgh. So who do you work for? What do you do now for a living? What I do now for a living is, so I run Indie Ground Films, which is a little kind of local thing. We rent props and costumes and, and whatever to people who need it. We have things like generators and tables and chairs. So any, any production support that people need, we can provide for small indie projects. Are you a principal on that? That's what, Yeah, that's my company there. And so it's just kind of something I've been doing out of my garage for the last couple of years. But uh, I upgraded and got a storage unit last year. And, you know, trying to, trying to meet people and people are starting to get 
word that they can come to me for resources. And PJ, who I think he had a guest on, or he was a guest uh, on one of your podcasts recently, he uh, hired me as a production designer, which is something I told myself I'd never do again, but he convinced me to, to get in and, and work on some commercials with him. Over the last year, I've worked on jumping between being a driver and a PA to being uh, you know, a fixer. There's a German company that called me up and said, we need somebody to to produce for us, basically, we're flying in Friday after Thanksgiving and filming on Monday, and we need all the equipment and all the crew. Can you figure it out? Wow. And so those are the kind of projects I like, where it's just like, I like a bit of chaos and craziness and, and responsibility. So if I was just a PA on that, I probably would have a miserable time, but because it was my responsibility, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Okay. I'm relatively new to the film scene, even though I'm doing this silly podcast, but explain to me what a producer does. Oh, I don't even know. So it I know it's like, probably uh, different on every level that you're sitting on. Yeah, I was going to say, if so I don't produce, like, so I'm not going to be doing, like, a Ford commercial. Like, nobody's coming and knocking on my door and saying, we here's a million dollars to go do a Ford commercial. The type of projects I love are at least little, like, 48-hour weekend film festivals or... From my perspective, I love story development, like a story producer. So if anybody has an idea that they want to sit around and figure out how we turn this concept of an idea into a feature film, and then once that script is done, how do we turn that into a budget and a schedule? And then once we have a budget and a schedule, how do we figure out how to get funding for it, which is a major blind spot for me. I'm pretty terrible at that. I'm the guy that can oversee getting us the equipment, getting us the locations, making sure all our licenses are, are you know filled out properly. How do we get it into post-production? How do we get it into distribution? The smaller scale the project, the more I enjoy it. Like, sure, I could do that on a bigger scale, but working with unions and having new, deep knowledge of how the paperwork and the paper trails and things like that that I need to deal with, it's just that's not big uh, a big interest for me. But just seeing a project getting moved from one stage to another to another and then out into the world, I really enjoy that. Hmm. How and do you find that kind of work? Recently, I guess people have been coming to me, but... I think a lot of it, you just have to be a kind of a go-getter and meet people who can't stop talking about their projects. And if you like the people and you like the sound of the project, then jump in on it. Can't say it really pays the bills well, but, you know, it's fun. So, like, the 48-hour film projects are all pro bono. So, like, how do you market yourself? Is it just having your name out there so that people will refer you when they get called for a project? Or how does that work? I think so. I think, um, well, I'm terrible at marketing. Like that's not, I can sit around with a group of people around a table and have discussions on how we want to get a project out. But if I'm left to my own devices, like I have no idea. What's a typical project now? What do you, I, I still don't really get this. Oh, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there's no typical project. It's, yeah, um, things come and go and they fall into my lap. I either jump on a project or I don't. Can you uh, give me a, like an example of like a medium um, in intricacy kind of thing? Yeah, well, I guess um, that German commercial would be a good example. So I was working as a PA on a, a commercial with like Juju Schuster Smith. And while we had some downtime, I was checking my emails and I had an email from a German company that said, hey, we're looking for a fixer for somebody to kind of help us. We're coming into town. Can you give us a, can you give us a hand? I'm just like, so how did they find you, do you think? Do you I know? still have no idea. So I asked them, and they're like, yeah, we, well, we Googled. And I'm like, well, how far down did you have to get before <laughs> like, you got to me? Um, but it's out there. But that's actually the second German company that I produced a commercial for. There was another one for Bayer that um, I got a call from a guy in New York who's like, we're looking for, for somebody to kind of – actually, no, that's not the way that one came. So, so um, Vicky Toner is a local production manager. I work with her a lot. You know, she usually shies me as a PA or a driver or whatever. Um, but this one, she's like, I can't take this commercial. They're looking for a, a coordinator. Would you be interested in doing that? And then it turns out it was a much smaller scale production. And the guy's like, well, do you want to just UPM it? And I'm like, sure. He's Wait, not going to give me UPM, a, what's that? a unit production manager. Basically the production manager on it. But he was a guy from New York. The company was Bayer. They were in, from Germany. They were coming to their plant out here. They were just shooting like a little, I can't even, I think it might have just been two days. But it was a very kind of sterile environment, so there were some weird rules that we had to like adhere to. But we wanted to keep it down to like a 20-person crew, and that was it. And so it was my job basically to hire the crew, make sure everybody got paid, and that was it. Make sure the day went smoothly, make sure we had food when we needed it and things like that. So it was a pretty, pretty simple job. Pay wasn't great. You know, the opportunity to step out of being a PA for that particular day was fine. 
I find that the older I get and the more that I moved around, like I'm totally happy with either having no responsibilities <laughs> or just being, you know, in charge with whatever falls in my lap. So is it because is it because you like are frustrated by people not doing their job or no, no. I mean, I think it's a matter of not having I've never I've really enjoyed jumping around job to job. I, as much as I hate freelancing, I, I like the opportunity to kind of learn different things. So spent a lot of time as an AD. I spent a lot of time in art department, spent a bunch of time in post-production. I like the opportunity to learn and stretch my wings. And like, I'm not somebody who's too shy about jumping into something that I don't really know what I'm doing and try to figure it out as I go along. Sometimes it's disastrous, but usually we get through it. But the experience and the, and the learning new things has always been interesting to me. With that, it's hard to kind of build a uh, career trajectory. So I can't say I'm going to start as a camera assistant and work my way up to someday being a, a director of photography. Well, that's that's one of the things I find interesting about this whole indie stuff is because you get to play with all these different things. Whereas mm. if if you make it big, yeah. like if you were like this big director, you don't get to play with that stuff anymore. You you or director, or if you're an AD, you're an AD. You know what I mean? Mm. Like you can make your make your way up the ladder. But to me, I really like the just eclectic bunch of skills you get to play with. Yeah, yeah, I like it a lot as well. I think that's something that really appealed to me. And um, if somebody said, "Hey, Alex, you want to direct the next Star Wars movie?" Then I would never say no to that. I think obviously nobody's ever going to come knocking on my door for that. But if I can live in that fifty thousand to five million dollar range, where there is just a—you mean that's your income? That, on? No, 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 no. <laughs> that is like I can. I would be more than happy to go out next week and shoot like a non-scripted, no-budget feature for fifty grand, and find the people who would have fun doing that, and let's go out and have fun and make a feature that we're all happy with. Or you know, up to like five million. Like I think that's something I could write, produce, direct, and know how that exists. But if somebody's going to give me thirty million. I'd be like, okay, well, that's five million for production costs and twenty-five million for like an A-list actor. Like, I I don't know how to make a thirty million dollar film. I don't even know if they make thirty million dollar films anymore. So the indie side of the film world really interests me from a lot of perspectives. But it, what it doesn't do is not financially rewarding for me. But luckily, I don't care. Like, I've <laughs> I, I've figured out a way to live my life with like very little money, and I'm happy with that as long as I can keep meeting people and making fun little projects. Okay, so. What part of filmmaking do you like best? I mean, since you've worn all these different hats. Well, I still love directing. Like, if I can make a career out of anything, it would be directing. But a weird part of me always thought that directing was just a bridge between two other things I loved, which was writing and editing. I'm a shitty editor, but I I like the process of editing and I, you know, put it like assembling the movie. So short answer is writer, director, producer. Specific answer would be director. But it's second on your list. It's tough. It's all kind of one on the same process to me. Writing, directing, producing is all sort of just filmmaking to me. Do you have training as a writer? Sort of. I mean, I went to school, took a lot of writing classes. I mean, that's about it. Um, I used to run the screenwriting. There's a guy named Chuck Palahniuk who wrote like Fight Club and a bunch of other stuff. And he has got a really big fan base. And a lot of those people would be... Uh, come to his website, which was kind of a, like a writer's website, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, competitions and a lot of people trying to, like, help each other. But I think probably the most famous person to come out of that site would be Chuck Wendig, who, uh, you know, writes Star Wars novels now and things like that. But I used to be in charge of, like, the screenwriter's portion of the website. So that's about as formal a training or formal experience I have. But mm-hmm. the rest was just read, you know, read scripts, uh, study, analyze movies. And you can download scripts online for free, basically, of all the big scripts, right? Yeah. Every year, the kind of Hollywood dumps all the Oscar-nominated scripts. But there's, there's libraries out there with thousands and thousands. And I used to collect them. You know, I probably have 5,000 scripts on my computer. But hmm. I don't read them nearly as much as I should. Like, I tried to, get, you know, while we were in quarantine, I was like, oh, I'm going to read, like, one a day. And I read, like, two. So. <laughs> I've never really read a famous script. But when you read through it, do you often find like where the director took it on their own to change it? Or do they change the script later too? Well, a lot of the scripts that I read are films that are directed by the writer. It's a writer-director. And the, I think that's part of the indie world is that you know you get these auteurs that are like, this is, this is the story I want to tell. I wrote it. I'm directing it. What I'm trying to do now is get into this process of analyzing scripts where 
you know, you watch a movie. If you enjoy the movie enough that you want to read the script, you find the script online. You read it once just blind. Like you just go in and you don't, you know, you don't have a pen. You don't, you don't have distractions. You just try to get absorbed into the story. And then the next time you read it, you start taking notes. And you're like, well, now you, you see themes emerging or you see how they structured the script to get to certain things. And eventually what I want to do is like four or five passes on the script, looking, kind of analyzing different elements of it. And then when that's all done, I would love to do an actual comparison with the film. I haven't quite got that far with it. So uh, the last movie that really interests me to do that was um, a Jesse Eisenberg movie called The Art of Self-Defense, which came out last year. I loved. It was kind of my cup of tea. The script is fantastic. It's very kind of very kind of dry, dark humor, uh, kind of dark comedy about karate. A guy like, you know, there's this band of criminals going around beating up people in this weird little town. And then he joins a karate club. And it's just a little drama. So read the script, loved it. And now I'm in that kind of second pass of like breaking it down into scenes and sequences and, and figuring out the structure and, and seeing how the themes of the, of the movie kind of work its way through the script. Do you like working on features more than shorts or vice versa? Depends. I think that, so the way I like to operate as a producer and just kind of as an individual is that if a friend of mine has a project and I trust that person to be able to kind of deliver something interesting and the project sounds interesting, if there's no money to it, let's keep it short. Let me ask one question. I'll, yeah. I'll try to get back to that if you don't yeah, lose your train no of thought. But, okay, when you say somebody comes to me with a project, yeah. now does that mean that they have just an idea at that point or do they have a written script at that point? It depends on uh, different projects or different things. So uh, a good example would be I just produced or co-produced a short film called Zero Nine Six, and that was the producer of that, Nathaniel Peters, is a good friend of mine. We've worked together on a lot of different projects. He originally came to me with a story, and he's like, here, can you read this? Give me some feedback. So I gave him some feedback on the script. I wasn't attached at that point. I was just a friend giving feedback. And then I gave feedback on a second round, and at some point they ended up, there's something out there in the world called an SCP, which is kind of like this network of people who write stories that scare each other and, and whatnot. And so this was sort of nicked from that. They raised a bunch of money to film it. At that point, it became a serious thing. And he came up to me and he's like, hey, you know, can you give me a hand? I, you know, helped with locations. I helped with, uh, like I say, kind of finalizing some script elements and, and then AD'd it and, you know, some other things that were involved with it. But it was basically like whatever he needed, he would ask me for specifically, rather than me being in charge of it and saying, well, this is what we need to do in order to get it done. I much prefer being the, the guy that says, like, let's do this. Let's plan ahead. How are we going to get this out? You know, what is our poster going to look like? What kind of music do we want? Things like that. But in this particular case, he just came to me and, like, we piecemealed my involvement with it. And he's a screenwriter? He is. I mean, what does he do for a living? Or was this like what a side Nathaniel gig? What does Nathaniel do for well, a living? It, no, it's, is a, this it's a, side a side gig. gig. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. He's uh, post-production. Like uh, He does um, kind of some visual effects stuff, I think. But like everybody in... So Pittsburgh's really interesting. And I, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the table. Pittsburgh is different than L.A. in the fact that everybody is very resourceful here. And everybody has to kind of jump from knowing one thing to knowing something else. And you're, you're doing... You know, you could be PAing you know, a Denzel Washington movie one week and then producing a 48-hour film festival thing the next week and then doing sound on a short film the next week and then driving for a commercial the following. So, like, that just seems to be the rhythm, or at least the people that I know and I work with uh, often, is that's the rhythm. It's just, like, one week you're doing something completely different than the next and the last. And I don't know a whole lot of people who are full-time filmmakers, or I didn't until this year, uh, know people that were full-time filmmakers in Pittsburgh. I've never been, like, I love that unions exist. They're out there doing good things, but I've never been a union guy. Like, I just don't know how I would operate within, you know, that rule or those rules. So I don't usually get on, like, a lot of big union films. And I have no interest in, like, being a PA for 16 hours a day, six days a week for, like, a month. Like, that doesn't interest me at all. But I wouldn't mind, you know, I could do that in short bursts, like do that for three or four days. And then I've got the rest of the week where I could just like do whatever the hell I want, including writing my own projects or trying to get, uh, I have a pilot that I'm trying to shop around now. So I'm doing final kind of edits on that, on that script, compiling a list of people I want to reach out to at some point. So when you're a PA on a big, 
isn't there value in that, like on a big program? Sure. Because you can sort of see how the, you know, the A team does it. Yeah, but I mean, but if you're there's only so much you can learn, is what I'm. Yeah, saying. I was gonna say if you're 20 years old and you're into you want you don't know what you want to do in the film world, like absolutely be a PA, watch, observe how other people do it, network, like just talk to people, kind of refine what you want to do. Uh, for me, no. I mean, the value of being it is like you're past that. Yeah, I mean, like I love being on set. Like uh, you know, I would I would work pro bono every day on little indie films if I could afford to do it. But I just can't, so I have to take gigs, and I would much rather just take a gig that has no responsibility. Right. So show up. There's a lot to be said for that. It leaves. Sure. I mean, I, I've been getting better at being a PA. Well, it leaves mind power for those things you really want to think about. Absolutely. Yeah, that's actually why I really enjoyed the job that I had when I moved to London. It was the first time I was able to have a day job and also feel like I could be a filmmaker uh, around the edges. And that was just this furniture company called Vitsu, that interesting business model. But we would, I'd get up in the morning, I would spend an hour writing or like 45 minutes writing. And it was just a really focused 45 minutes, which is not my normal kind of go-to writing habit. And then I'd go to work for eight hours. And then I'd get home by like five o'clock and I would spend you know, spend an hour catching up on emails and I hang out with my wife when she gets home or get home, we'd have dinner, watch a movie or whatever. And then like right before de uh, bed, I would just sit there and like blitz through emails and, and be a quote unquote producer as we prepped for whatever our next project was. And that was just fun for me. And we were able to, you know, like get to a point where I had a little group of friends who we would go out and try to make films, like one short film a month on the weekends, mostly as an exercise of doing it, but also like we came up with some good content. And then my wife got her visa and we moved back to the U.S. before we kind of got too deep into it. But that's sort of what I'm trying to recreate in the U.S. is, you know, here in Pittsburgh. It's just find, uh, you know, a writer, director, editing team that we can just like get together once a week, have some beers, talk story ideas once a month, go out and shoot something. And then on top of that, like I said, I'm running my, my production company, I'm renting stuff out. And, you know, like that's more interesting to me than trying to find my next PA gig. Right. So. so do most writers work on multiple projects at one time, or do they sort of just focus laser on one thing? I couldn't tell you anybody else's process, but I would imagine that from the people I've talked to that, I mean, well, from my own experience, like talking to other writers, like good writers are just brimming with ideas. And I couldn't tell you if everybody is the same as me, where I'm like, I get bored of a project halfway through, or I, I, I guess I really stopped calling myself a writer a few years ago, I've sort of got back into doing it, but I stopped calling myself a writer because I don't have the constitution to kind of sit and redraft a story. Like once it's stuck in my head, I just finesse around the edges until it's where I want it to be. But I know writers who are just like, ah, that's not working, scrap it, let's start from the beginning. And I'm like, okay, you're a writer, whereas I'm just kind of like a guy who's fiddling with a story. So, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know anybody else's process. I just know that when when I get creatives in a group and we're just kind of sitting around a table having coffee, it's really tough to stay on one project in a, in a discussion because everybody's got ideas and everybody wants to, to make something. And, and that's part of the thing I love about it is, is that kind of sharing of ideas or that enthusiasm over an idea. And every once in a while you kind of latch onto one that just like it works or something like the idea works. We know how to film it. We know what our audience is. Like we know how to get the money for that. Let's go do it. You're a member of the Carnegie Screenwriters, right? Yeah, just kind of haven't been there in a while. They're great, though. They're one of the first people I hit up when I moved to town. And yeah. Yeah, I went to a couple of meetings, and it's really pretty cool. I, I, I would recommend that for anybody mm -hmm. that's a, into yeah, filmmaking. Yeah, even if you're not, I was going to say, even if you're not really a writer, it's just great to go out to. So what's your biggest movie success to date? Um, my biggest movie success to date? Well, I'm really proud of the fact that I've finished a feature that had zero budget. That, that was really tough. Uh, this 096 that we just released, it had a million views in about three weeks. So that was exciting. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, but that was all Clay and Nathaniel and the other producer, Jason. They put in a lot more time on it than I did. But it was still nice to be a part of something that um, was that successful and that popular. Is that the feature you just mentioned? Or? No, it was a short film. What's the feature that you completed? Oh, so that's a movie called The Buskers and Lou. And it was just. So I'm going to back up a little bit. But when I was in L.A., I had had well, kind of the final straw really with me in L.A. was I had this script that I really, really liked. It was about a hitchhiker, a truck driver, and a dog kind of in an 18-wheel truck driving through the desert in the middle of the night. It was supposed to be really simple, and it was supposed to be heavily improv. 
you know, something where you can go shoot for like $200,000 and two actors. And I had landed a line producer, which was, you know, big deal at the time. And she got me some meetings. And one of the meetings was like the last of the meetings. The guy's like, he had just produced a million dollar feature that I had art directed on. And, you know, he's just like, I like the script. Tell me what you want. I'm like, I want 200 grand and I want to kind of cast these two people. I want to throw the script out the window and develop the characters and the dialogue with them. Uh, and he's like, oh, you know, that's cute. But like, <laughs> you know, what I want is like uh, Tommy Lee Jones. And I'm like, oh, great. Good. I, good I love your vision, but like a million dollar feature. Good looking Tommy Lee Jones. But like the conversation's in a good place. Let's keep going. Um, but he wanted his son as the actor and he wanted somebody else to direct it. And he wanted to rewrite the script with like flashbacks and a romance and things like that. And I'm just like my vision of this thing and your vision of this thing is totally different. And if I was in that meeting today, I would approach it totally differently than I did as like a 25 year old or whatever. And like, I'm just like, fuck this, you know, I'm going home. And so, you know, I lived with a couple actors. I, one of my roommates was a cinematographer or wanted to be a cinematographer. And I'm like, let's just develop it something that we can just go out and shoot. And like a month later we were done. Like we had finished filming a, a feature f- length film and we, we basically had no script. It was all index cards. It was all interior coffee shop day. Emma walks in, sees her cousin and says hello. And like, that's the scene. And we'd find a coffee shop. We sat for an hour, we filmed a conversation and we did, we shot a 90 minute feature in five days with no script. And it was myself, my camera operator, roommate, our sound guy didn't show up. So I'm doing sound. And I'm writing the script as we're going. So I was I was doing 22 hour days. All the actors were doing 18 hour days. Like it was just obnoxious. It shouldn't be done. But getting it done, and actually, you know, I spent a couple of years like jumping around from that point to Salt Lake City and Portland, and I would be editing as I was going. And at the end of it, I really, really loved it. Like I, that to me, that was my biz- biggest success in that it got done and it got the vision I wanted across, and all the emotions hit the way I wanted to. It just sounded like shit, so nobody's ever going to see it. Mm-hmm. So, like, to me, as a filmmaker, it's obviously not a success because nobody's ever going to see it. But, you know, like, to me, that's my biggest thing. It's like we just had a passion project and a drive to go out and create something, and we did it, and it mo- more or less hit what we wanted to hit. And then I fell in love with this whole, like, non-scripted, collaborative filmmaking process that I'd never done before. So. You still like that? Process? I love it, yeah. Huh. To me, that's crazy to I, invest it's all that. It's insane, yeah. Well, I think that now that I, so my follow-up feature was filmed in a very similar way, but we took our time with it and discovered that there's some cons from, uh, you know, there's pros and cons of everything, but um, more time means you're kind of like losing enthusiasm. And, you know, like if you're not having, if you're not being brought to set, you know, if you're not getting paid to be there, you, other things come up in the way and you, you're losing the enthusiasm for it. So what worked the first time was that we just said, fuck it, let's take a week and like just go shoot this crazy ass movie. And the fact that we were all on the same page in terms of we liked these no budget things, we liked these kind of characters, we liked the, the experience, the craziness of it. So we're all willing to dive into it. Whereas if I ask a professional union sound guy to come do a little crazy ass shoot for a week, they're probably not going to enjoy it the same way. So Right. Yeah. I find that, you know, I have a day job, nine to five, and I love doing the weekend gigs, but when someone wants that to go over to a Monday or a Friday, yeah, it's, you just can't do it because you, you know. Well, that's what, so I, I've said this before, like I, I don't like being a freelancer, but I w- I'm willing to jump on projects for free um, i mean i'm not associating freelancer with you heard that paid. everybody out there yeah is. exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> well here's the thing so um I've, I've built these rules in that i'm like i'm willing to take a project if like if i like the director if i like the story if i don't think i'm going to be taking advantage of in terms of uh you tell me what you want and what you expect and i tell you what i want and expect and like if we see eye to eye let's stick to that but if if you tell me it's going to be a 12 hour day and all of a sudden it's an 18 hour day and you want me to come back tomorrow, like that's taking advantage of somebody. Uh, I expect there to be decent food. I expect to like out of pocket costs to be covered. I expect to be credited properly. You know, like there's certain parameters I'm willing to work with, but you know, it's few and far between. I think like, you know, like you have to have the good story to start and then a good personality. Like I just, I'm too old to work with dickheads, you know? So do you have a plan to make it big or do you just, are you happy right where you are? Oh, I have no interest in making it big. I don't think I've ever had an interest in making it big. Yeah. And I don't 
care about plans either. So Yeah, you're an improv guy. Yeah, more or less, I think. Um, I don't know when that happened, but it sort of became that way. Um, I have stories that I want to write. I have stories that I want to get out there. I have a series that is based in Pittsburgh that I'm trying to shop around. That's kind of like this noir inner city murder mystery. So kind of a tough sell, but if I can get it in front of the right producing or production company, then maybe something will happen with it. Um, so I have no expectations at this point. I just kind of, I'm along for the ride. I really enjoy it. It's all about like the people you're working with and the, the art that you come up with on the other end. And I'm happy every once in a while, like taking well-paid gigs that need whatever talent that I have. And that's fine if I'm available, but otherwise like I've got other ways of making money. Hmm. Are you drawn to a certain genre as far as writing goes? As far as writing goes, yeah, I think um, I'm a really big fan of suspenseful dramas. I'm a fan of thrillers, you know, art house horror, things like that. Why is it so many people are drawn to horror films, like as in the indie? Is it just budget related? I, it can be just budget related, but that's probably a big part of it is that you can, well, I think part of it, I don't know if this is a, if you, if you're sitting there and you're, you're detached from story and you're just a person who's like, okay, I want to set up a business model and, and how are we going to make money? Horror is not a bad way to go because there is always going to be a fan base for horror. It doesn't matter if you make the schlockiest, crappiest thing or you make the highest highbrow thing, there's going to be an audience for you. Whereas like drama, it's going to be a smaller audience, you know, musicals and an even smaller audience, you know. And then if you want to do a Western, like the costs of doing a Western are probably a lot higher than just a torture film in a basement or whatever. Uh, and also I think you can get away... If you write a really good story, there's an audience for that. If you don't write a really good story, but you do the horror elements well, there's going to be an audience for that. So it's just a weird genre. But in terms of like the writer's approach to it, like, I don't know. Like, I, I'm sure that people get into writing horror for all sorts of different reasons. So. You said there's a mark, always going to be a market for horror. Like, one of the things I've, like, how is there a market for short? anything i don't even know i have no idea uh i've don't think i've ever made a penny off any of my short films but so when i was in la the idea of doing a short film just it didn't exist it wasn't a concept it was you know if you did a short film it had to be really interesting and it had to be five minutes or shorter there wasn't going to be an audience for it anyway so a lot of people who were doing shorts were just doing it as like you know, I've got this, uh, it was when the red camera came out, like I've got this really nice camera that shoots in 4K, so we're going we're gonna to experiment with it, we're going to make a short film, and then I'm going to have some really good-looking footage to use in a demo reel. Like, that was literally the only reason you would ever shoot a short. Or, like, I've got a feature, but I'm going to go shoot a short promo for it. But that's and, what the indie indie industry is built around, shorts, isn't it? it? Well, now it's weird, because I think it was with the advent of YouTube and and Vimeo, there's now all of a sudden like, you know, audience distribution, distribution yeah. angles that weren't available 15 years ago. And then on top of that, there are every single city has like 10 film festivals. And so there's just like an, just this cavernous, like you just need more footage to, or more like uh, films to feed this like festival circuit. So yeah, I mean, now, now you can get short films seen anywhere. So I think it's interesting. Yeah. Well, you can go, I mean, there's these weird trajectories that exist and you know, this isn't what I would want. I mean, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't say no to this, but like you can go from being, what is his name? Is it Gareth Edwards? Like there's a couple of Gareth directors out there, but I think he made a short film. Then he made this movie called Monster or Monsters. Based on the same original script? I can't remember what the story is behind it, but he was mostly like a VFX guy, if I remember correctly. So he went from short film to low budget feature that he did everything himself to I think he did one other movie and then he did a Star Wars film. And so there's this trajectory that exists to go from being like the indie darling to being a big blockbuster director. That's everybody's carrot. Yeah, exactly. That must be it. So like Ryan Johnson's the same thing. Like he did Brick, which I loved. He did a couple other like small movies, Brothers Bloom and Looper. I mean, there were well-known actors in all of them and they had a, a budget for it. And then all of a sudden, like he did a couple episodes of Breaking Bad and then he's directing a Star Wars movie. And you're like, well, there you go. Like... That's the trajectory now is to go from little indie movie to Star Wars so, hmm. or Marvel. One of the things I don't understand about that trajectory is uh, most indie filmmakers, like we talked about earlier, are people that wear many hats. Mm -hmm. So as you go from the lowest rung to the highest rung, you have to like niche that 
you know, where, what you want to be. Do you want to be the director, whatever. And as you're going along, say you have this short film and like you said, with yours, the sound sucked. You hmm. know what I mean? It's like, would that film ever be recognized with having a weak link in it like that? I mean, it's never going to be seen because the sound was so bad. I mean, there's probably a, if, uh, if in 20 years Criterion's like, hey, we want to uh, take this unseen first feature and like redo the sound with it and release it, like, sure, great, that's fine. I can fix it. I have no interest in fixing it at this point because it's sort of, uh, you know, shot it 10 years ago, didn't have any idea how to do the proper paperwork, so I'd have to like knock on actors' doors. No, I guess, what, like, I guess what I was getting at was not yours in particular, but I'm saying being recognized, like doing a doing a short film, and that short film is going to be, it's going to lack, whoever does it, it's going to lack in a lot of different ways. It doesn't always have to. Like, so there's a guy in town, he might be worth having a chat on this podcast, but like Stephen Terselli, he, uh, when I first moved to Pittsburgh, so the first person I met was PJ Gaynard, who we had sort of mutual friends. Uh, and I think at that conversation I had with him, he pointed out that there was like a Three Rivers Film Festival or something going on at the time. I think it's defunct at, at this point. But I popped over to the festival and I sort of put my head in the theater thinking, oh, I'll stay here for five minutes and just, you know, bow out and then meet some people at the end of it. But I walked in at the beginning of this really, really amazing film that just had its own complete, like its own personality, its own visual style. It's, it, it was just really compelling, expertly done. And I'm like, oh, this must be some, like, some guy in L.A. or someone from wherever, you know, had a bunch of money and then submitted it to this little like festival in Pittsburgh for whatever reason. But it turns out it's a guy who now lives here. He was in Albuquerque at the time when he made it. And so I've worked with him on a bunch of things. And, you know, he's just a great guy, really fun to, to be around, but just does expert short films. And hopefully he gets the budget to actually do a feature and hopefully he gives me a call to produce it with him. But you can make short projects with very little money and still be expert. Like they can, you know, the sound is great. The cinematography is strong. The acting is really good. Like, you don't have to be bad at things. So. Right. So, okay, what's his primary role in the projects, mostly? His, on this project, he wrote, produced, and directed, I believe. Okay, but if it has great cinematography, yeah, is that his fault or is that his cinematographer's? Well, it's, as a producer, it's his fault for hiring. Or it's not a fault. Credit. It's, right, it's his credit for hiring the right guy and having a strong visual style. So I think that... Nowadays, like, equipment is so cheap, information is readily available. Like, go onto YouTube and just Google, like, what does Roger Deakins do? Or whatever, like, whoever your favorite cinematographer is. And you can start learning a style. And whereas, like, 20 years ago, when nobody was making short films and equipment was a lot more expensive, like, it's a lot harder to practice. Whereas now, you could just get a camera that shoots. Again, I'm not a camera guy. I'm not a techie. But, like... You know, you get I don't know what like, K it's up to now, six, eight, whatever. Yeah, who the hell knows? Yeah, exactly. And so, but you can get a really nice looking camera that is better than anything we'd ever seen in like the history of the world for like a few grand and like just go and practice. So, and then, you know, if you're a, a DP, you get a, a style or a certain kind of like look that you, that you get good at. And if I'm a producer, I'm like, yeah, that look and my st- subject matter of my story, they, they fit. Like, let's see if this guy wants to be involved. So hmm. that's. And I know a lot of uh, writer, director, producers who shoot as well. Sometimes this, so, uh, the story is kind of what suffers, and that's that's something I don't want to do. Is like let, let my story suffer, but you know, like I wouldn't DP my own projects because I know what my limitations are. So make sure you hire good people. So, what are your strengths as a filmmaker? Writing, um, storytelling. I think uh, encouragement uh, to get things done is something I'm pretty particularly strong at. My uh, roommate, who was one of the actors in my feature film, uh, we didn't talk for a while when we got it done, just because it was just like, we, we have to push it through. And I think I, you know, I don't think he was ready for like that level of, of Alex at that point. Uh, but he nicknamed me the bulldozer at the end of that. He's <laughs> just like, you know, we had to get it done. And I was there to kind of push it along. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty good at talent scout. I think that's a, a, good, a good talent as a producer is recognizing talent in others. Um, and being open and collaborative. Um, so from a producer standpoint, I feel like those are some strengths of mine. I think as a director, I think I know my stories really well and how I'd want to tell them. 
So how do you find crew talent? Is it just, okay, you you worked on a project and you really like this guy, so the next project you Mostly, just ask yeah. him to help? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, the start for it. Or, um, you know... Word of mouth, I guess. Yeah, a lot of it's word of mouth. Or just like, I like to work with people I get along with. So if you're on a film set, like, say, we're on, or doing a commercial or whatever, uh, and you really get along with somebody, like, talk about projects. And if they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds fun, then call them up a few weeks later and say, are you still interested? And see what happens. So, so what are your weaknesses as a filmmaker? Uh, I think not caring about like, so to me, I have a bunch of scripts and I'm like, do I spend my time and try to get this out to a production company that can actually like fund it properly? Or do we just say, fuck it and go and make something that we have the capacity to make? Uh, and I will always sort of like, jump on the next immediate project if it can be done easier than the hard work of actually like networking with money men in other cities or whatever you know like like there's certain things i don't like to do i'm much more eager to just get a project and get on set and have fun with it than i am like sitting in front of a computer or sitting in front of a phone and and going proper avenues to get to get funding for things what about as a writer what are your strengths i mean like what do you find that you do best um, well, I think I could, f uh, one thing I'm pretty good at is understanding a story to the point that like, if, uh, you've got a general idea of a concept and you want to sit down and talk it out, like we can get it from beginning to the middle to the end. I can help guide a story to get it to the point that needs to be in and, you know, figuring out what the theme of the story is and finding the dramatic heart of the story. I think I'm pretty good at that. I was kind of, I made one film in my life and it really sucked. <laughs> But one of the interesting things that I've been researching on the side is the difference between story of a feature and the story of a short. Mm. Like, what are the basic, like, differences in your mind? When you're thinking short, it's this. If you're thinking feature, it's this. I mean, is it... Um, well, that's a good question. It's something that I've really just didn't, never had a concept on like how to shoot a short film up until fairly recently like so some of the advice I worked at Sundance for a few years and the advice I was constantly getting while I was out there is like you don't make a short film that's more than five minutes long because we will never program it and you're like well if Sundance isn't going to program it then you know like why even do it again this is going back a few years I thought uh, their categories were they probably broadened up a little bit, but they. this was back in 2008, and 2010 was actually when the head of programming came out and like had a little meeting with people, and they're like, I was working sound for the Sundance channel, and I guess we were interviewing him, and, and he's like, yeah, we just don't. It's an unwritten rule that we won't program anything over five minutes long. Um, so to me, I, my story ideas were either 90 minutes to like two or three hours, or they were like 12 hours, but nothing below 90 minutes. So I had no idea of like how to shoot a short film because I didn't think in terms of, of short stories. And to me, it's just like you have to have just a, a couple beats and like you, I, I don't know. I always felt that shorts should be flashy, whereas features, I like to work towards the finale. And I feel like that's something that's not really a focus anymore is what the actual like finale of your movie is. So I really don't like flashy. I really don't like, really fast paced stories. Like I like to just slowly ease my way into something and then have it slowly build gradually over 90 minutes. And then you get to your point and have it poignant and, you know, worth the 90 minutes to get there, which is complete opposite of the way I see short films. But saying that I've made a bunch now and they've all been a bit different, but like the 48 hours kind of focuses you to the 48 hour film contest or the three K is a, a, another one that's here in town. It's 3000 minutes. So whatever that is, 60 hours or 50 hours. It, it focuses you to say, what can we make? What kind of story can we tell in like seven minutes? It's been fun, but the beats are pretty much there. You still have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but you don't have side stories or B stories, or you don't have, di like, you're not going to do like a seven-minute dialogue scene in a, in a short film. Where do you go to continue to learn about? Well, I mean, I still watch a lot of movies. I like to learn, you know, how other people have, told stories and reading the scripts are all very, you know, enlightening. Just the nature of filmmaking in Pittsburgh means you get hired on very random things from time to time and, you know, you're constantly learning from that. And then uh, just other people, I think, so I, I mentioned earlier that one of the things I don't like to do is like get on the phone and talk to, you know, investors and things like that. 
what I love and what I haven't been able to establish here in Pittsburgh yet, for whatever reason, is I don't want to just be a lone wolf filmmaker in town. Like, I want to be part of a group. And just everybody here in town is... Everyone I talk to is like, yeah, I really want to be a part of a group, but nobody actually does it. Everybody's just very resourceful and independent out here, and that's both a positive and a negative. I would love to be able to just sit around a table and say, okay, this is how we're going to reach out to investors. This is how we're going to distribute it. This is, these are the festivals we're going to reach out to. These are the programmers we're going to call. When I'm left to my own devices, uh, that's the stuff that I completely ignore, whereas what I want to do is be able to do that collaboratively with two or three other people, and we all have the same agenda. We're all working on the same project. Uh, and that is, I assume, where we can get, when we start getting actual funding rather than like paid out of pocket funding. I totally forgot what your actual question was. Oh, about learning. So um, there's all these things that I want to learn and do, but there's, when it comes down to just like me sitting in my room or, you know, at my computer and like deciding what I'm going to do for the day, am I going to, you know, watch a movie or read a script or, you know, go out and network or whatever the case may be. Like, there's things to learn and glean from all the process, but like, there's a big chunk of stuff that I want to do and I want to learn, but I feel like that's where I need partnership. So, how would you go about creating a group of these people? Don't know. I've been failing for about a year now. So, um, <laughs> how did you do it in the past or did it just happen? Uh, well, no, it worked really well in London. Like, there were a couple guys. Uh, so, I had an editor that I, I, that worked on my feature film. He had just moved to London from whatever little island he was living on. Uh, he was great. He was an awesome guy. We just would get together and drink Guinness every once in a while and then work on my feature film. I had a writing, a friend who I'd met who was working in advertisement. He was you know, writing commercials and things like that. Um, but he wanted to learn how to produce and direct. And then I had another buddy who uh, I knew when I was living in Scotland. We both moved to London at the same time. And he was writer, director, but mostly post-production guy. So he works on like James Bond movies and Spider, or like Superman movies or whatever. So what we did was just make this little group of folk who, we had one dedicated writer, but we had three talented story people. All three of us knew how to tell stories, uh, but one guy would actually work on the first draft of the script and then we would all do edits or whatever. So we'd meet together once every once in a while and just like pitch story ideas until we found one that we liked. And then one guy would go off and do a draft and then I would do a draft and then the other guy would do a draft. And then eventually we got it to the way where we wanted it and then I would be in charge of production. And then when the production was done, the other guy would be in charge of post-production. So we had this nice little like workflow that I really enjoyed. I just haven't been able to find kind of the same mechanics here in Pittsburgh and there are people out there that I love working with that if, if they called me up tomorrow and said, hey, let's start this little group, then I would say, sure. But what I've been doing is having meetings and talking to people and seeing who would be interested. Everybody's interested. Nobody actually commits. And that's something of, like, it's just frustrating to no end to me. So I'm off doing my own little, like, indie stuff. Like everybody else. Huh? Like everybody else. But, like, everybody talks about, like, like Pittsburgh is really great for the no budget, uh, run and gun weekend projects. Like there's no end of things to jump on. If you want to be a, uh, you know, AD or an art director or whatever, the sound guy, like there's always something going on. There's also big projects that come into town, which are great. It, people that pays the bills, like everybody wants to work on those, but there's nothing in between or there's very little limited options in between. And that's the world that I want to exist in, but I can't get to that world without like partnering up and everybody wants to get to this world but nobody's willing to partner up I, I think there's a large portion of the people here in the industry i call it an industry but it, it's not about really making money for most of them and that's mm. kind of what i'm getting to is yeah they look at it as a weekend warrior kind of hobby almost yeah. whereas you're looking at it as sort of a profession but i think everybody that i've interviewed you know if you say do you want to be a professional at this they all say yes so it might be interesting to, I don't know. And everybody seems to have a team that they work with all mm -hmm. the time. But I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, there's a lot of cinematographers that I've worked with um, that I really enjoyed working with them. But what I want to do is branch out and just work with more people. So like eventually I can call back, you know, the guy that I did this short with or the person I did this short with. Like we've established a friendship. We've established that we work well together. Um, but I'm still fairly new to the Pittsburgh scene, and I want to kind of work with as many people as possible. And that way, when something happens, that we can kind of step up our game and be a bit more professional and, and you know, um, be a bit more ambitious with, with our projects. I have a wider knowledge of people in town that I can, like a wider range of people I can call up for different projects. Um, 
if it was up to me, like my dream job would just be a, like a studio boss. Like I would love to just have a warehouse somewhere outside of town and somebody funding money to say like, all right, here's a million dollars, go shoot ten hundred thousand dollar films. And like my job is to oversee those 10 films. Like that, that's what I would love to do. Um, above even directing, I think. You know. We keep talking about people that fund films. Mm. Who are these people? Again, it's baffling. So there are rich business folk who need like tax write-offs and they they're willing to fund projects for that reason but you have to like know who those people are and that's this is who you want to talk to a line producer because they're the people who are kind of most in touch with the money there are production companies out there who are looking for content there are you know distributing you know like things like netflix or they've got billions of dollars at their disposal but as far as i know i've i haven't put much time into reaching out I don't really know the avenues of reaching out. What I've been told is that they headhunt. Like Netflix is a headhunting company. They don't take people just cold calling and saying, we've got a project. What they do is they've got people finding short films that they like and then offering them deals. Or they'll go find a little indie feature at a film festival that's doing really well. And they'll say, well, we'll host your film on our thing, but also we'll give you funding for the next one. This is all stuff that I would love to, again, kind of sit around with people and develop uh, like, how are we going to one? Let's break our script down into a budget and and know exactly what we're looking for. Let's put together a little prospectus, and then two, what is our um, avenue for getting it out there? Who are we going to reach out to, and and what? Um, you can send query letters as a writer. You can send like uh, query letters out to managers and agents, but chances of getting through to anybody is very very slim. Um, same thing probably with production companies. Like people are just inundated with stories. So how do you kind of step, how do you get around or get your foot in a door when you're just in Pittsburgh and all the action's happening in LA or New York or whatever? I guess that's what everybody's referring to. Proof, proof of, of concepts. Con- or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's what I was saying earlier. It's like short films didn't exist. There was more kind of proof of concept. And um, and that's great. So, so with this pilot that I wrote, I'm really happy for, and I think it'll be that, like that would be, it's kind of an outlier in terms of the type of things I write. Um, but in what a, ways? Well, it's a series rather than a, a feature uh, for in one way. And then in two, it's a pretty big production. It's a, a lot of characters, and it would be, it would have to be an HBO or Showtime or Netflix type of thing. Um, it's not a little, like, indie thing that I would go out and do uh, on my own. Um, so what I want to do, so... Uh, it would be great if I had all the money in the world at my disposal and just shoot the pilot the way I want to shoot the pilot, hiring the cast that, or bringing on the cast that I want to bring on for it. But I know that, like, if I get it to HBO or whatever, they're going to want their people. They're going to want um, talent that they can, and like, name talent that they can use to sell and get, you know, viewership. I can't afford that. So how do I go out and, and get that done? Do I just shout the pilot around? Blindly, do I send, spend money to get it into uh, contests and festivals and hope that something happens from that? Uh, do I send query letters out to, act, uh, to um, you know, uh, production companies or to agents and things like that? Um, but none of that seems appealing to me because I've heard nothing. Like, very rarely do you hear, like, that actually works. So what I'd love to do is find, uh, you know, go and shoot a little, not a proof of concept, but like a short film that's in the same world and then send that out with a script and say, like, here's the log line, here's a one-pager to kind of give you an outline of, of what's happening, here's the script, and also here's a little short film to kind of give you a taste of the world that we're filming in. Um, and we were building up to that before this uh, whole pandemic thing happened. <laughs> How far along are you? Have you cast people for it? No, haven't cast. We've thought about who we're going to cast, but then... Um, I'm really wishy-washy in what I want to do. So I've got I've worked with a writer named Eben Parker, and we developed a story. But that was the idea was to do the little anthology of like six different stories um, that all fit within the same world. So we'd have like an um, actual little YouTube channel with concept art and things like that. Um, so we had written the first script, but it was you know I told him like. And this is the problem with writers. They're all great. But I'm like, okay, well, we want like a little seven-minute or ten-minute thing. And then that became 15, and that became 22. <laughs> and I was like, well, now it's just not something I could do out of pocket on a weekend. You know, like now it has to be a, it's a bigger production. Um, so then uh, I was working another guy that would be worth chatting with here would be Ryan Austin. Uh, I work with him a lot. 
um, another kind of producer, writer, director guy in town. Um, somebody, one of the very few people in town that I actually like see eye to eye with films, like my kind of the type of films I like is hard to find other filmmakers out here. Um, but yeah, so him and I sat down and we kind of got into this process of like, okay, if we're going to produce this, how are we going to do it? Uh, and then he's just like, well, instead of doing like one 22 minute thing, like let's break that down. And, and so again, it's just kind of evolving into a different thing. Uh, and so it became more work than it was worth at the moment and more cost than I can afford at the moment. So I kind of shelved it. And then like two days later, we're all in lockdown anyway. So, um, so that's back in, in limbo. So I don't know exactly how that's going to get out there, but hmm. it's ready. The script of the pilot is ready to go, but what we do to get, promote the pilot is, is in limbo. So that's the way it works sometimes. I think you just have to have a thousand po- like projects done and in your pocket as in terms of like being a writer so that when you meet people and you find out what they're interested in, you're like, Oh, well here's an action adventure feature or here's like a low budget uh, drama or whatever. And just have things available to give to people. So do you tend to work with the same crew? Um, more or less, but we're, I'm like I say, I'm constantly looking for new people to collaborate with and new stories to tell and, you know, keep me on my toes and keep me from getting too bored. And there's always, people that aren't available when you need them. Kind exactly. Of yeah. <laughs> and I don't, you know, when I first, um, you know, like a year ago when I started making films in Pittsburgh, um, I didn't know any grips. I didn't know any sound folk. And so it's just like, you're reaching out to whoever might be available and you're taking word of mouth recommendations and you meet people that you either like or you don't like, and you kind of refine your list going forward. So there's definitely the, the people that I will contact first for availability. And then if they're not, they're not available, there's second tier and third tier not in terms of talent or quality, but in terms of like my relationship with, and you keep branching out. But I'm, I love kind of just working with new people and meeting new people. So. Yeah. Are you pretty happy with the quality of the crew here in Pittsburgh? Oh, that is unbelievable. Unbelievable crew out here. I didn't move out here for the film industry, but it's just been, it's blown me away by how good the talent is. And the, the, you hear the same thing as well when crews from LA and New York come here that they don't really have high expectations and then they end up, just every expectation has exceeded. And, wow, that's good yeah, to hear. It's, yeah, I've heard nothing but like glowing reviews about Pittsburgh crews. Is there any shortage of one type of crew member? Uh, if you're talking to PJ, he would probably say art directors. So uh, that's how he got me on his last commercial. Um, sound is something that you, you know, Chris Bell and a few other people that are kind of the go-to sound guys. But yeah, I think sound art are good places. If you're, if you're looking to carve a little niche for yourself, that's a good place to look. So what's your favorite thing about filmmaking? I mean, what is it that you think draws you to it? I stopped thinking I was drawn to it and I stopped enjoying a lot of it. I actually think it's more of a compulsion than anything else. So, um, for good or for bad, I'm a filmmaker. And, you know, if you ask my wife, like, well, if I've got five minutes to myself, it's, it falls into what should I be doing? How can I be making a movie? I'm, I'm not very good at like relaxing or doing any or doing nothing. Um, I stopped reading. I, you know, I'm kind of obsessed with a couple of video games in the moment now that, now that we're not doing anything with our lives, but, um, but otherwise I'm, I'm just a filmmaker. So whatever I can do to get on set, that's usually what I do. Um, what about the other side? What, what do you like least about filmmaking? Uh, production designing. Um, no, I, I just trying to find funding or like, I hate talking to people about pay on set. I hate when people are there to make a paycheck and they don't care about anything else. So I'm not going to name any names, but there's people in town. I'm just like, I like, like we're on a project that's a, a weekend competition thing nobody's getting paid. You didn't have to sign up for this, so why are you complaining about money? Or there's been other times where, like, you're literally the only person we're spending any money on, uh, and I'm here for free and everybody else is here for free, but you're getting paid, so why are you complaining? Like, just if you don't want to be here, don't be here. Like, you're just bringing everything down. Right, I understand that. But there are some positions, like, that are just a ton of work for... Totally. I mean, I'm an AD. Like, I understand. And a production designer, first one in, last one out. Like, I get it, and I don't want to be taken advantage of, but that's why everybody should have parameters. And if you're not willing to work with, like, then don't take the job. Right. I was thinking about, like, editing, for example. Oh, God, yeah. I think there's not a lot of patting on the back or pay. You know, like, if it's a freebie kind of project... 
the editor probably works harder oh, than God, anybody. The editors get so fucked. Like everybody. Well, that's the whole in- the industry is just always about fucking people, and that's why like you have to just be <laughs> open and honest about things. Like, are we either doing this? For me personally, if I could work pro bono all the time, I would. If I could pay great rates for people, then I would. But sometimes projects come up and you're like, well, this is a low budget project. I can pay you like a hundred bucks for eight hours, and we're gonna stick to that. Are you willing to do it? And if you say yes, though, then you can't complain about it. Like you don't have to say yes. Right. And nobody's gonna be offended if you say no. Like if that's not what you want to do, then I hundred percent understand. Like, and the other thing is on the flip side of that, as a producer of of projects, sometimes we don't have any money and we're just going out and doing it on spec and we're having fun with it. If the day before you get a job on like a film or something that comes in town, I am not gonna be offended. Like it is my job as a producer to fill your spot at the midnight hour. Like you do not have to worry about like it not gonna break any sort of like relationship. The fact that you found a paid job, like that's totally 100% fine. Do you think that's a common belief? Because from a commercial photography perspective, it's like once I give my word that I'm going to show up that day, I pretty much have to show up. But I'm. Well, if you're not showing up because, like. Well, I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. When it happened to me with um, a project through someone that I had met at the screenwriters, it's like they hired me, well, not hired, you know, nobody's paying me. It was for a project. And it was on. Um, a weekend, which is normally not a problem for me because mm. I normally don't work weekends, but I agreed to work on a Saturday for this project. So somewhere out of the blue, I get called for a Saturday job, mm-hmm. which means I lost, you know, over a thousand dollars because I turned that job away, but I had given my word that I'd be on this project. And then what happened was the film crew canceled me for that Saturday. It was just the most bizarre thing. Whereas I had turned away a thousand dollars that I could okay. have made for a commitment that I had on a Saturday, but that yeah. quit. So I, I don't know. I need to, you know, I think your idea of setting the parameters up front saying, okay, if this happens, then this, mm. and this is what I, you know, this is what I'm offering kind of thing. Yeah. And um, that's, that's interesting to know. It's not something that works for everybody and everybody's got to kind of find what they're most comfortable with. But like, to me, if I commit to a project, I'm trying to, I do my best to see it through, but there's t- times where, like, sometimes life stuff gets in the way. Like, I, sorry, I told you I can work on your project this weekend, but I got to take my dog to the vet. It's an emergency. Like, sorry. What you should do in that case is try to find a replacement. And so, like, if you sometimes you can't, sometimes a replacement can't be found. Sometimes you're going to burn some bridges. But like, from the producer standpoint, I understand that you're here to help me out on my project. We're mostly just having fun with things. Um, there's probably no uh, real like financial reward for getting this short film done anyway. I'm going to be spending way too much money like in post production and getting it out, sent out to film festivals. Like this movie is never going to make any money. We're just doing it because we want this movie to be made, and you want to be a part of that. But if something comes along that, like if you count, cancel out on me because you got another job that kind of came out of the blue, that's great. Try to give me a buffer, like a day or whatever, to find a replacement. Um, if you cancel out on me because you'd rather just like stay at home and barbecue or whatever, like that's kind <laughs> yeah, of, that's, that's, that's a that's different thing. Low. And you know, like it happens and I try not to like, you know, like I want to work with people I want to work with, but if I keep getting burned by somebody, I'm not going to oh, want yeah. to work with them. Yeah. So. I mean, you have to be able to, like you're, as a filmmaker, you're organizing so many different mm. pieces to this puzzle. And yeah. if someone screws you, then. Well, that's what happened with that. With Hurricane Emma was my first feature film that was the one that we shot in a week with no script and like literally we all got together in a van full of stuff and we're going to drive two hours out to palm springs where i knew a bunch of locations that we could film and put like places we could sleep on the floor and like i literally slept on the floor in front of the bathroom for a week you know like trying to get this thing done um the sound guy didn't show up and like i knew we only had four days with our primary actors and we're like well like Either we're not going to make this thing. Like, if we say no now, we're just never going to have the momentum to come back and do it. Um, or I'm going to take on another, put another hat on, and I'm going to do the sound as we go. And which is fine for like 75% of the scenes, but like Palm Springs is like the windiest place in the country. And like the outdoor scenes just sound like shit. And, uh, you know, like, was it better in retrospect to do nothing, or was it better to do something that will never be seen? And Mike, I'm still in love with the movie. I love the performances and the like the way the music worked in it and the way that they had it come together that like I wouldn't change anything. I would just you know, Get wish the sound, sound yeah. wish the sound guy showed up. So, I know there's yeah. there's there's a lot of this where I'm just willing to 
like you know there's a weak link and you know it's going nowhere eventually but mm. it's it's like it's like good practice mm. and it's just it's fun to do that's why I'm there anyways because you're doing it not making money anyway so yeah. you know I don't want to make it seem like everything I do is no <laughs> no fun like that's like we do get money from time to time to shoot projects we pay people when we can pay people and uh, we don't make nearly as many projects as we want to because funding isn't there and we have to turn turn projects down um but when you do like find something that you really are passionate about, like I don't think the money should be the difference between making or not making something. Like mm. that's that's my opinion. Right. I think that's where the passion part of it comes in. Mm. So, what advice would you give someone just breaking into filmmaking? <laughs> Go do something. <laughs> don't else. do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean like one, you don't need to move to LA. Wait until you're invited to go to LA before you go to LA. I feel like. Um, a lot of people who move to L.A. do so just to get out of their hometown, which is fine. Um, but people go there way too early. You don't have the experience you need. You don't have, like, a resume. You don't have a demo reel. Like, you can't really market yourself. You're only going to be one of 30 million people. Whereas if you stay home, you know people, you know locations, um, you have access to cheap equipment that you can go out and make things. Just uh, from the writer perspective, the only advice I have is, watch movies, read and analyze scripts, and get feedback. Like, those are the three things you need to be a writer. It's like, just do that forever and ever and ever and ever until you're really good at it. Uh, for a director, I don't know what a specific advice to give to directors, um, but just in general, network, don't be a dick, learn how to not get taken advantage of, learn to say no for projects. Like, you don't have to say yes to everything. Uh, when you do say yes, make sure you've committed to it and see it through, uh, if at all possible. Um, and yeah, I mean, just learn and enjoy it. So where can people go to see your films? AlexCassonFilm.com has my demo reel and a bunch of projects on there. You can get my feature film, The Buskers and Lou, is available on Amazon and Google Play and Xfinity you know whatever. it's all all over the internet um so however you watch movies you can probably find it yeah indie ground films if you go onto facebook and instagram you can find indie ground films there okay any parting advice just to the filmmaking community in general yeah i mean just keep keep doing things like try to break away from zombie movies for a bit and like religious thrillers and spread your wings a bit pittsburgh but in general just pittsburgh's a great town for filmmaking and keep having fun with it Okay. Well, thank you very much, Alex. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Take fun. care. Thanks. Okay, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you found us on our webpage, please leave a comment and let us know what you think. If you found us on iTunes or Spotify and you like the show, please leave a rating or review. And whatever you do, hit the subscribe button.